Good to see everybody here. Would we all stand? We're going to sing the Father's house today, okay? Sometimes on this journey, sometimes on this journey, I get lost in my mistakes. What looks to me like weakness is a canvas for your strength. And my story isn't over, my story's just begun. Failure won't define me, cause that's what my father does. Failure won't define me, cause that's what my father does. Oh, lay your burdens down. Oh, here in the father's house, check your shame at the door, cause it ain't welcome anymore. Ooh, you're in the father's house. Rival's not the end game, the journey's where you are. You never wanted perfect, you just wanted my heart. And the story isn't over, if the story isn't good. Failure's never final, when the Father's in the room. Failure's never final, when the Father's in the room. Oh. Your burdens down. Oh, here in the Father's house, check your shame at the door, cause it ain't welcome anymore. Oh, you're in the Father's house. Prodigals come home, helpless find hope. Love is on the move when the Father's in the room. Prison doors fling wide, the dead come to life. Love is on the move when the Father's in the room. Miracles take place, the cynical find faith. Love is breaking through when the Father's in the room. Jericho's walls are quaking, strongholds now are shaking. Love is breaking through when the Father's in the room. Love is breaking through when the Father's in the room. Oh, oh lay your burdens down. Oh, here in the Father's house, check your shame at the door, cause it ain't welcome anymore. Oh, here in the Father's house. Amen. Welcome to the Lord's house this morning. We're glad that you're here. We're glad that you're here. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for this day that we've been given by you. We thank you for the sunshine and the, the warmth of springtime. We thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to come and join together with you in your house this morning. Thank you for the love that you uh, give us, that you bestow upon us. We thank you, Lord, for uh, all of the blessings of life, all of the provision that you, you give to us each and every day. We thank you, Lord, for your word this morning, which we've studied. We thank you for each person who is here, who's gathered to worship you this morning. We just pray that uh, 
as we gather, we do seek your face, that we, we lay our burdens down at your feet and that we uh, just listen to your voice speak to our hearts this morning as we are all here today. Ask the Lord to continue to be with those who need your help, those who need uh, uh, just uh, physical healing in their life. We ask you to be with them, those who are lonely that need uh, a Christian friend to drop by or to call on the phone. We just pray that you would help us to minister to those in those ways. Lord, we ask you to be with our North American missionaries at this time, especially, Lord, as we think about uh, giving toward that endeavor this time of year. Lord, lead us to give as you lead us to, and we just thank you, Lord, for uh, the churches and for the people uh, that uh, are planning those churches across our country in the areas that so need it so very badly. And now, Lord, we just ask you to bless our time together this morning that we may truly worship you today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. How many were in Sunday school this morning? Let's do that first. Just raise your hand. Now, do we have a count? Uh, 45. All right, 45. We're glad that you came, studied together with us this morning in Sunday school or Bible study. Whatever you want to call it anymore, we don't care what you call it. Just come and study with us. Tonight at 5, don't forget, choir practice. Choir practice at 5 for our Easter musical. This Wednesday, remember, we'll not be having any midweek service on Wednesday due to spring break. And then on uh, next uh, the Wednesday following the 27th will be our kids' Easter egg hunt. We are still in the process of, of you bringing eggs to hunt. So uh, that basket back there in the back is for that purpose. So if you have some eggs, you could fill with uh, some goodies. Uh, place them back there in that uh, basket. And then, of course, uh, Easter Sunday morning, the 31st, we'll present our Easter musical and... Uh, be inviting people to come on Easter Sunday, but not just Easter Sunday, every Sunday morning. Uh, it'd be good to get them all here before that time and uh, so that they uh, don't just see it as one special occasion and then we don't see them again for another six months. We, we hope that you'll be inviting people to that. And then also Baptism Sunday, April the 7th. That's going to be the following Sunday after Easter. So uh, uh, be talking about that to people. As you have your gospel conversations with people, talk to them about uh, being obedient to the Lord in baptism once they're saved. And if you're interested in that or have questions about that, see me. And so that Sunday morning, we can baptize as many as we need to baptize. So that'll be uh, our goal for April the 7th. Did I miss any announcements this morning? All right. Kids' message time. have to go to school for a full week. That's kind of nice, isn't it? But mom and dad probably have chores for you to do, right? I have a picture here. I know um, <coughs> Miss Caitlin and Chad talked uh, a few weeks ago about growing and growing seeds. I wanted you to see a project we've been doing in second grade. So if you'll look at those, we did a science experiment called germination. And our big question was, will seeds germinate in the sunlight or will they germinate in the darkness? And you had to take a good guess of what you think would happen. What do you guys think happened? Do you think the seeds germinate? You can't tell, can you? <laughs> These are pictures of your seeds. So what do you think happened? They actually germinated in both. Look at these. Those were some from inside the dark. We put them in a cabinet. They're wrapped up into a paper, a wet paper towel, and they're just bean seeds. Did you see the little brown? Those are pinto beans that you would eat at home if you cooked them. And we wrapped them up in a wet paper towel and put them in the dark. 
And before too long, because of the, the damp, uh, they began to crack open. And life, the root came forth. If you'll look at that, there's something called a taproot. It's that main root. It's real thick. It bursts out. Every seed has energy in it. There's some hidden energy inside a seed. But you can't get to it because it has this hard outer shell on it. So to get to that hard outer shell, you have to have some moisture to kind of break open that seed. But it has to be done. And then you can't just leave it like that. It has to be put into soil. And it requires, what do you think it requires? What, do a seed, what does a seed need to grow? Water, soil, sunlight. And it needs air. So it needs all those things to grow. So we then took them out. You can show us that next one. And this was Harper's growing, and she is measuring it, and she is documenting it in class. Just two or three weeks later, it is taken off, and it has really, really grown. She came back. She had been gone a few weeks, and she was, uh, I mean, a few days, probably about three or four days, and she had been sick. And she was sad because hers hadn't grown as much as everybody else's. And she said, Grandma, why didn't mine grow? And I said, well... I had to put yours in later. I was thinking you were going to come back, and I had to put it in later. So the later I put it in, hers didn't grow as fast, did it? But once she started taking care of it, what do you think happened? It caught up with the rest of them pretty quick just by taking care of it, watering it and taking care of it. Now, I want you to know that there is a verse in the Bible. Uh, Jesus used plants and talking about them all the time. I love this one verse that he used. It says, unless a grain of wheat falls to the ground. Well, where did it go? Lose it? Probably did. Unless a grain of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it cannot, it cannot uh, bear fruit. It will not grow. It has to die first, and then is when it starts to grow. Several of my kids, while it was growing, the outer shell started coming off. And they started crying, and they thought, oh, no, their bean's dead, and it's not going to work anymore. But that's what has to take place for growth to happen. The outer part has to come off. And did you know, once you become a Christian, it's an awful lot like this. Once you germinate, it's nice that you can come to church, and you, and you learn about Jesus, and you give your life to Jesus. But if you don't get planted in the dirt and you don't get planted in the soil of God's word, you wither up and you die. You need to be planted into God's word, and that's where growth takes place because that is where you come to know him, and he grows you the exact way that you're supposed to be grown. There's a verse later on that sometimes we get frustrated the older we get, and things get frustrating as we're growing in Christ, and we think, oh, this is awful. I'm going through such bad times. But listen to what it says here. Therefore, we do not lose heart, even though our outer man is decaying, just like that seed. Our inner man is being renewed day by day. For momentarily, light affliction is producing for us eternal weight of glory far beyond all comparison. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are just temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Once you give your heart and your life to Christ and you get start growing in Christ, you have to look to the future, and the future is way beyond what's happening here on earth. Eternity is forever. It's not just during while we're living on this earth, okay? So if you hear one word today, look up the word eternal and go home and talk about that. What does eternal mean? It's forever. So once we start planting the seed and, and God begins growing in us, it's forever. So stay rooted and stay planted in God's word so you will grow and he will use you in the way that he wants to, okay? Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you so much that we can learn so much from your word. We um, sometimes are frustrated that it. It's kind of scary to know that we have to give up what we want to do, Lord, that we have to die to self and allow you to change us. Help us to throw off that outer part, Lord, and just be um, 
living in you, Father, and is planted in you so you would grow us where you wanted us to be. And, Father, that we just don't see the things that are happening right now, but, God, we see the future and what you have planned for us. For it's in your name we pray. Amen. Alone in my sorrow and dead in my sin Lost without hope with no place to begin Your love made a way to let mercy come in When death was arrested and my life began Ash was redeemed, only beauty remains. My orphan heart was given a name. My morning grew quiet, my feet rose to dance. When death was arrested and my life began. Oh, your grace so free washes over me. You have made me new now. Life begins with you. It's your endless love pouring down on us. You have made us new. Released from my chains, I'm a prisoner no more. My shame was a ransom he faithfully bore. He canceled my debt and he called me his friend. When death was arrested and my life began. Oh, your grace so free. Washes over me. You have made me new now. Life begins with you. It's your endless love pouring down on us. You have made us new now. Life begins with you. Our Savior displayed on a criminal's cross. Darkness rejoiced as though heaven had lost. But then Jesus arose with our freedom in hand. That's when death was arrested and my life began. Oh, your grace so free washes over me. You have made me new now. Life begins with you. It's your endless love pouring down on us. You have made us new now life begins with you we're free oh we're free free forever we're free come join the song of all the redeemed yes we're free free forever amen when death was arrested and my life began we're free free Forever we're free. Come join the song of all the redeemed. Yes, we're free, free forever. Amen. When death was arrested and my life began. When death was arrested and my life began. 
when death was arrested and my life began. All right. Going into our hymnal, we'll do Tis So Sweet to Trust in Jesus. So sweet to trust in Jesus, just to take him at his word, just to rest upon his promise, just to know the safe the Lord. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him, how I've proved him o'er and o'er. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust him more. Oh, how sweet to trust in Jesus, just to trust his cleansing blood, just in Full faith to plunge me neath the healing, cleansing flood. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him, how I've proved him o'er and o'er. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust him more. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus, just from sin and self to cease, just from Jesus simply talking, life and rest and joy and peace. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust Him, how I've proved. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust him. I'm so glad. I'm so glad I learned to trust thee, precious Jesus, Savior, friend. And I know that you are with me, will be with me to the Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him, how I've proved him more and more. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust him more. Would you guys stand? We're going to sing, You Are My King. I'm forgiven because you were forsaken. I'm accepted, you were condemned. Now I'm alive and well, your spirit is within me because you died and rose again. Amazing love, how can it be that you, my King, would die for me? Amazing love, I know it's true, and it's my joy to honor you in all I do. I honor you. You are my king. You are my king. You are my king. Jesus, you are my king. Jesus, you are my king. 
amazing love how can it be that you my king would die for me amazing love i know it's true and it's my joy to honor you in all i do I honor you. Let's go back to I'm forgiven. I'm forgiven because you were forsaken. I'm accepted. You were condemned. And I'm alive and well. Your spirit is within me because you died and rose again. Amazing love, how can it be that you, my King, would die for me? Amazing love, I know it's true, and it's my joy to honor you in all I do. I honor you, you are my king, you are my king, Jesus, you are my king, Jesus, you are my king. Amazing love, how can it be that you, my King, would die for me? Amazing love, I know it's true, and it's my joy to honor you in all I do. I honor you. You are my king. One last time. You are my king. You are my king. Jesus, you are my king. Jesus, you are my king. Amen. Amen. As we come to this time of continuing to worship through the giving of tithes and offerings, and especially our offering to our North American Mission offering uh, this month. Brother Wayne Muir, would you lead us in prayer, please?
First Peter chapter 3, verse 18 says this, For Christ also suffered once for sin, the just for the unjust, and then it tells us why, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made it be, but being made alive by the Spirit. If you would turn with me to Mark chapter 14 this morning. Mark chapter 14. I want us to continue this morning thinking about the components of the Easter season. We have looked at the component, first of all, of, of the blood of Jesus being shed and why it was a necessary part of Jesus' sacrificial death. We also looked at prophecy, prophecy about the Messiah and the odds of one man fulfilling all of the prophecies about the Messiah and how Jesus fulfilled them all. And this morning I want us to take a look at the cross. Take a look at the cross itself. The Messiah had to die as a sacrificial lamb for mankind, making atonement and pain the penalty once and for all for our sins. God chose the time and the place and the method for the death of Christ. 2,000 years ago in Jerusalem, in a, the central city of the Jewish religion, where the temple was, and God would accomplish this sacrificial death of his own son through the method of crucifixion. For a person, I believe, to truly understand the love that God has for us, for a person to truly understand the horribleness of sin in our life and what that does to God, for a person to truly understand even what it really means to be saved and how important we are to God and what it means to give your life to Him as your Savior, then I think you have to take a very close look at the crucifixion. Two brothers were playing on the sandbanks by a river one day. One ran after the other up this large mound of sand and unfortunately the mound was not solid and the weight of the boys climbing up caused them to sink in the sand to fall and them to be in that sand very quickly. When the boys didn't return home for dinner, the family and neighbors organized a search and they found the younger brother unconscious with his head and shoulders sticking out above the sand. And when they cleared the sand to his waist, he regained consciousness. And the searchers asked him, they said, where is your brother? And the younger one replied, he said, I'm standing on his shoulders. With the sacrifice of his own life, the older brother lifted the younger brother to safety. And that is exactly what Jesus has done for us. The tangible and sacrificial love of the older brother literally served as the foundation for the younger brother's life. And this is magnified in what Jesus Christ did for us on Calvary. Jesus' sacrificial death on the cross is part of the foundational, the foundation of our salvation for every single person who places their faith and trust in Jesus Christ and his glorious resurrection. You see, God the Father desperately wanted to have a renewed relationship with his prized creation. He created man with the intention of us being in unbroken fellowship with him forever, communicating and sharing life in a perfect world together as his created children of God. And, but then after our fall into sin in the Garden of Eden, the Heavenly Father knew that mankind was in a hopeless situation to do anything about our own sin and to be brought back into that original state of righteousness with God. 
Scripture tells us that the, the blood of bulls and goats was never enough to save man eternally. Hebrews 10.4 says, For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats could take away sins. And by that we will have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all. He follows up in verse 10. So a new sacrifice had to be offered, one that would be once and for all. He sent his own son, Jesus, to be that sacrifice. 1 Peter 3.18 tells us that he suffered once for sin, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, making us alive by the Spirit. And so now we stand on the risen shoulders of Christ if we trust in him for salvation. To pay for our sin, there had to be a death. It's the way it's always been. Blood had to be shed and there had to be death for sin to be forgiven. We've already talked about the blood, and so now let's look at the cross and at the giving and the taking of the life of Jesus in the crucifixion. You see, the cross is about a holy God. It's about a sinful people and the God-man Savior, Jesus Christ, providing reconciliation for us between God and man who provided the ultimate sacrifice for sin. Here in Mark chapter 14, we see that Jesus has celebrated the Lord's Supper with the disciples the night before his crucifixion, knowing that the time was uh, for his uh, crucifixion was at hand. After praying in the Garden of Eden with the disciples, Judas brings, as it says in all of the Gospels, a multitude with him with clubs and weapons and swords. And many people assume that these people that he brought with him were Roman soldiers, but I don't believe that that is true. John identifies them as a detachment of armed troops and officers from the chief priests and Pharisees. They were more than likely Jewish temple guards, not Roman soldiers. You see, the Jews had their own security force still. They had a security force that would be in charge around the temple, especially in those days when great crowds would gather for various festivals and occasions there at the temple. And so these were a group of Jewish cohorts that Judas brings with him. Roman soldiers don't get involved until later on in the story. So in Mark chapter 14, beginning in verse 43, it says, And immediately while he, speaking of Jesus, uh, was speak, still speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, with a great multitude with swords and clubs, came from the chief priest and the scribes and the elders. And then jump down to verse 53. And they led Jesus away to the high priest. And with him were assembled all the chief priests, the elders, and the scribes. But Peter followed him at a distance right into the courtyard of the high priest, and he sat with the servants and warmed himself by the fire. Now the chief priest and all the council sought testimony against Jesus to put him to death, but they found none. For many bore false witness against him, but their testimonies did not agree. And then some rose up and bore false witness against him, saying, We heard him say, I will destroy this temple made with hands, and within three days I will build another made without hands. But not even then did their testimony agree. And the high priest stood up in the midst and asked Jesus, saying, Do you answer nothing? What is it these men testify against you? But he kept silent, answering nothing. And again the high priest asked him, saying to him, Are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed? And Jesus said, I am, and you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the power and coming with the clouds of heaven. And then the high priest tore his clothes and said, What further do we need to have witnesses? You have heard the blasphemy. What do you think? And they all condemned him to be deserving of death. And then some began to spit on him and to blindfold him and to beat him and to say to him, Prophesy. And the officers struck him with the palms of their hands. Now, one of the things 
And one of the main things that the cross symbolizes to us is rejection. Rejection. Not God's rejection of man, but rather man's rejection of God. First of all, we see the rejection by the priests. It says Jesus was rejected by the Jewish religious leaders in the power of his day. He was rejected by those who should have been the very first to recognize him as the Christ, as the Messiah. And so this account takes us to this Jewish court that they immediately take Jesus to from the garden. The Jewish leaders arrest Jesus. Now I want you to remember that this part of the arrest is only the Jews. It's the Jewish leaders and the Jewish officers only. And they take Jesus to their ruling body of the Sanhedrin, the chief priests, the elders, and the scribes, and they begin to question and accuse him. And it tells us in that passage that all the council sought testimony against Jesus to put him to death, but found none. Then it says, many bore false witness against him, but their testimonies did not agree. It says, we heard him say, I will destroy this temple made with hands, and within three days I will build another made without hands. But not even then did their testimony agree. When they questioned him again, they said, do you answer nothing? What is it these men testify against you? He still keeps silent says nothing. And so at the end of their frustration of his silence, the Jewish high priest asked him another question. Are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed? Meaning Son of God. And at this point, and at this point only, Jesus breaks his silence with the truth once and for all to hear and to know. And he says, I am. And of course we know that's how God identified himself to Moses, right? I am. And then he says, and you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right of hand of the power and coming with the clouds of heaven. And at that point the high priest tore his clothes and he accused Jesus of blasphemy. Now, if it had been anyone else except Jesus saying that, that would be fine. That would have been right. But Jesus didn't commit blasphemy because he was telling the truth. He truly is the Christ. He truly is the Messiah, the Son of God. Let me ask you, did Jesus say, destroy this temple in three days, I will raise it up? He did, didn't he? He spoke the truth, but in that he did not answer the question. He didn't speak. He'd already spoken the truth. Jesus didn't answer the allegation about the temple, but notice the only question he answered was about who he truly was. I am the Messiah, the Christ. You see, that is the question we must all ask ourselves. Do we believe that Jesus is truly the Messiah, the Son of God? We must all answer that question. And that's our personal predicament today in this world. Maybe you're here today and you've wondered your whole life, is Jesus who he says he is? Is Jesus really the way to have my sin forgiven and to be put back into right relationship with God? Is trusting in Jesus really how I get forgiveness for my sin and entrance into heaven instead of hell? Well, the truth is in the word, and it is believed by faith. So the question is, do you really believe it? Maybe in your head, but do you believe it in your heart? The, the Jewish leaders definitely did not. Verse 64 says, and they all condemned him to be deserving of death. Now notice it says, they all, every single one of them condemned him. Not one dissenting vote or voice. The vote of the priest and the council was unanimous. They did not believe. They thought that they were sentencing Jesus. 
They thought that they were passing judgment on Jesus, but instead they were bringing judgment upon themselves. In reality, this unanimous decision passed judgment on their unbelief. Jesus says, I am the Messiah. Are you the Christ or the Son of the blessed? And then secondly, right after that, look at what he says. It's kind of interesting because it seems to be, why did he bounce to that all of a sudden? As soon as he says, I am, and then he says, and you will see me, the Son of God, sitting at the right hand of the power and coming with the clouds of heaven. What Jesus is saying is this, today you sit here and pass judgment upon me, but upon this day forward you will see me sitting at the right hand of God, and the next time you see me, I will be coming with my people and my angels to gather the nations, and at that time I will be your judge. Then look at what they did next. Keep in mind that this is, again, the Jewish religious establishment and temple officers. Some of them began to spit on him, to blindfold him, to beat him, and to mock him and say, prophesy. And then they struck him with the palms of their hand. The actions of these religious men teach us a very important truth, and that is that dead religion has no place with Jesus Christ. The Jewish religious leaders had a good thing going for themselves as far as a daily life in Israel is concerned. They held all of the power over the people. They were making vast amount of money through the buying and selling that went on in the temple. They were rich, they were powerful in their own Speaking, They believed that they were right with God, though they were not. They, these men taught or thought that they were justified in all of their actions. They believed that religion was enough. And so the Jews rejected Jesus because dead religion has no place in being in Jesus Christ. The fact that no religious system has room for Jesus. Nothing that is just religion will ever include Jesus. Religion is all about human involvement and human activity and a man's way of trying to be right with God. Religion is always based on external works of man trying to make himself right with God. Biblical Christianity, on the other hand, is always based on faith. Religion seeks to approach God on the basis of what man can do. Biblical Christianity seeks to approach God on the basis of what God has done for us through Jesus Christ. And there is a vast difference between the two. And that brings us to this second group that we see reject Jesus, and that is the Romans. In this case, the Gentile rulers of the day, the Jews... The people, Jesus' own people, have rejected him officially. And now we got, jump to the Roman court, the Gentile rulers of the day. Now the Jewish council knows that they're not allowed to carry out the death sentence. These Jewish people that have arrested Jesus, now they take him to uh, the Roman government officials because they know it's uh, illegal for them to put Jesus to death. They can't do it on their own without the approval of the Roman government. Only the, if the Roman government signs off on it can they put someone to death. And putting to Jesus to death is exactly what they want to do. And so they take him to the ruling Roman governor, Pilate, because he has the power to sentence Jesus to death. Mark 15, beginning in the first verse, says, Immediately in the morning the chief priest held a consultation, with the elders and scribes and the whole council, and they bound Jesus and led him away and delivered him to Pilate. In other words, they met and they talked about it and said, let's take him to Pilate. And then Pilate asked them, asked Jesus, are you the king of the Jews? And he answered him and said to him, it is as you say. And the chief priest accused him of many things, but answered, he answered nothing. Again, that was the Jewish chief priest. And then Pilate asked him again, saying, Do you answer nothing? Notice he's not speaking to the Jews. 
See how many things they testify against you, but Jesus still answered nothing, so that Pilate marveled. So after questioning Jesus, Pilate knows that Jesus has done nothing wrong, for sure nothing worthy of death or really even of imprisonment. But the Jews don't want Jesus just to be put in prison. They want him dead and gone. So hoping to quiet the crowd, and at this point, in other Gospels, Mark doesn't write about Pilate sending him to Herod. It only deals with the issue here with Pilate. And so, in order to try to quiet the crowd, Pilate offers to give them a trade, of, a trade of uh, exchanging this, a murdering robber, an insurrectionist named Barabbas, thinking that they would accept the offer and then he could be done with this, this big mess. Maybe it would settle it. But the Jews weren't satisfied with that. They were going to accept the exchange, but they still weren't satisfied with just that. They wanted blood. They wanted death for Jesus, which probably would have been Barabbas' penalty as well. But they wanted blood and they wanted death. Unknowingly, those were the two things that we need for forgiveness of sin. But Pilate asked them, that crowd, that Jewish crowd that day, what he should do with Jesus because as he says in verse in that verse he says what then do you want me to do with him who you call king of the Jews and so they cried out again crucify him and Pilate said to them why what evil has he done and so Pilate wanting to gratify the crowd releases Barabbas to them and he delivered Jesus after he had scourged him to be crucified and so they didn't want Jesus to be let go because it was against the Roman law for them to kill him. And so they cry out for him to be crucified. And Pilate caves in. He gives in to it. This Gentile governor compromises his convictions. He knows Jesus isn't guilty of anything. But he gives in to the crowd because he wants this to be over with and out of his hair because they have given him a lot of trouble over his time as governor. So now not just the Jews, but the Gentiles now, the Roman rulers and us as non-Jewish people are responsible for the death of Jesus. Let me bring out verse 13 here because it identifies a third group of people. Verse 13 says, So they cried out again. Crucify him. Now some of these are the chief priests and officers, and people like that, but it's also just people in the crowd. They're not just the Jewish leaders or the Roman soldiers. That's us. That's the people, the common, ordinary people who many were just the day before cheering his entry into Jerusalem. You see, the rejection of Jesus, the king of kings, is complete. He's been rejected by the priests. He's been rejected by the Roman rulers and the Gentiles. And now he's rejected by all of the people. And then verse 16 says, Then the soldiers led him away. This time it's soldiers. It's Roman soldiers. Led him away into the hall called the Praetorium. And they called together the whole garrison. Probably at least 60 to 100 people. Soldiers. And they clothed him with purple. They twisted a crown of thorns, put it on his head, and began to salute him. Hail, King of the Jews. And then they struck him on the head with the reed and spat on him. And bowing the knee, they worshipped him. And when they had mocked him, they took off the purple from him and put on his clothes and led him out to crucify him. You see what they did to Jesus? This isn't the Jewish group. This is the Romans now. They put a purple robe on him because it signified royalty and they began to mock him as a king not because they believed he was but they were mocking him and it says they bowed and they knelt and they fake worshipped him they spit on him they struck him in the head with a reed some kind of a flexible stick after they put that crown on him 
They mocked him even more, and then they stripped him of that robe and put on his regular clothes, and then it says they let him out to be crucified. Folks, this is what Jesus had to go through so that you and I could have our sins paid for. He did this for you. He did it for me. And we need to let that sink in. And it, it makes me want to tell people and anyone who is thinking about being saved, anybody who is wanting to receive Christ as their Savior and Lord, don't you dare think about asking Jesus to save you before you consider what he did to save you. What he went through. Because that signifies how much he truly loves us. But there's more. We haven't even gotten to the crucifixion yet. Verse 21 says, Then they compelled a certain man, Simon, a, a Cyrenian, the father of Alexander and Rufus, and as he was coming out of the country and passing by to, to bear his cross, he was too weak to carry it on his own. And they brought him to the place called Golgotha, which is translated place of a skull, and they gave him wine mingled with myrrh to drink, but he did not take it. And when they crucified him, they divided his garments, casting lots for them to determine what every man should take. Now it was the third hour, and they crucified him. And the inscription of his accusation was written above, the king of the Jews. Not he said he was, but he, the king of the Jews. And with him they also crucified two robbers, one at his right and the other on his left. Now let me paraphrase the, paraphrase the next set of verses. I'm going to call these the, the final temptation of Jesus. Now we talk about the temptation of Jesus early in his ministry. How Satan took him to three different places and tempted him to do various things to try to get him to disqualify himself as our Savior and Messiah. And we, we think maybe that Jesus just wasn't tempted much after that. But I want to, you to see the final temptation of Jesus on the cross. They blasphemed him. They shook their heads in mockery at him. Aha, you, destroy, you who destroy the temple, build it in three days. Save yourself. Come down from that cross. The chief priest say, he saved others, him he cannot save. Let the Christ, the King of Israel, descend now from the cross that we may see and believe. And it also says that even those who were crucified with him reviled him. Eventually one of them had a change of heart. So I want you to see the temptation here. Here is this, the all-powerful Son of God. Beat, whipped, spit on, mocked, and mocked, and mocked some more. And the truth is, he will rebuild the temple in three days. He only, he's talking about a different kind of temple. He will save others. And he could save himself, but he won't. Because it's the only way that you and I could be saved. Think of how that must have tempted Jesus in those final moments after he's gone through everything he's gone through as his hands and his feet are nailed to that cross, hanging there in pain. Yes, he could call on legions of angels in this very moment to come and rescue him from, from the cross as they shout these things to him. Prove it, prove it, prove it, prove you're the Messiah, they basically say to him over and over again. And he has the power to prove it. But what does he do? He stays on the cross. Think about the temptation to just, if that had been me, I'd been so angry with what I'm hearing. You guys think you're so smart, you think you're so strong. Let me show you who I really am right now. He could have called him. He could have called fire down from heaven upon them right then and there if he'd wanted to, but he didn't. Verse 33 says, Now when the sixth hour had come, and there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour, and at the ninth hour Jesus cried out with a loud voice, saying, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which is translated, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Some of those who stood by when they heard that said, Look, he's calling for Elijah. 
And then someone ran and filled a sponge full of sour wine, put it on a reed and offered it to him to drink, saying, let him alone. Let us see if Elijah will come to take him down. And Jesus, it says, cried out with a loud voice and breathed his last. What a temptation that must have been. But yet, he stayed on the cross. When we look at Jesus and what people did to him on that day, we must see ourselves. Not in him, but in them. This morning, may we realize that it was our sin, just like the sin of those people there in that day and time that put Jesus on the cross. And so today we either see that we are walking with our faith in Jesus or we see that we are guilty of rejecting the king. And the question that Pilate asked them is the same question that you and I and any person must still ask themselves to do. What then do you want me to do with Jesus? Let me ask you again to don't dare think about giving your life to Christ before taking a look at the cross. Knowing what he did in dying for you, only then can you truly, truly understand and make a faith-based decision to follow Christ. Like the crowd that day, we will either reject him or we'll believe. What will you do this morning? Let's stand as we pray. Father in heaven, thank you so much for your extravagant love. The kind of love that would sacrifice your only son on the cross for us. and sin. He didn't just die on the cross, he went through so much more. But Lord... We thank you for that sacrifice this morning. Father, if there's anyone here who has not yet answered the question of what they will do with Jesus, we pray that today would be the day that they would, by faith, trust in him.